Hi, it's Gene, retired in Mexico, and we ask one question on this channel, which is, do they write them and sing them like they used to? Now, a lot of people, young and old, they think the old music is better than the new music. And here's a case in point. So this will be the second time that I try to take apart someone who's knocking your generation. This is a video called, Why Today's Music Sucks from a guy named Michael Nolan, The Bottom Line. So I've watched about half this video and I found a pretty glaring mistake in it. So let's go ahead and hit this up. Uh, it's 17 and a half minutes long, so I may do some edits to cut this down. But let's go ahead and uh, check out what this guy has to say. I'll pause and make comments along the way. Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, Michael Nolan. And tonight we're going to be discussing why today's popular music, well, sucks. You know, I don't think it's really that big of a secret that a whole lot of people have been disappointed in a lot of the popular music that has been coming out in the last 20 years. But you know, this is a trend that if you take a look at the history of rock and pop rock music, that I would say started around the early 80s. It was at that time that the police released their last album, Synchronicity, in a time period where that album was the only really rock piece that could possibly be considered as equal as to some of the output that, well, Michael Jackson and Prince was putting out at that time. It was at that time we saw an increase in a spotlight on the individual artist. Now there Okay, a spotlight on the individual artist. He may have a point there, but to say that the police synchronicity was the only rock album that competed you know, he's picking on, so MTV, right? MTV started in 1981, I think, with the Buggles, uh, Radio Killed the Video Star was the first video, and then they were criticized for not playing enough black music, and so Michael Jackson got on there, and he became a huge star. Well, okay, that's great. Prince, yeah, yeah, I mean, hallelujah. We got some black artists on TV. Awesome, you know? That's where rock and roll came from to begin with. So we were just returning to form. And uh, to say that the police were the only rock band in 1983 and through the rest of the 80s, you just didn't... Uh, yeah, that's too narrow of a bandwidth. So uh, right off the top of my head, um, I'd have to pull up one of my spreadsheets. I've been working on some uh, I, I've done some projects from 80s music to help deepen my uh, background here. But there's tons of stuff. I mean, what? The, how about the Smiths? How about the Smiths? Okay. They came around about 84. And what about... Um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of all the, the bands in 83 and 84. But uh, there's one right there. The Smiths. Sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. There were still highlights during the remainder of the 80s Sorry into for that the early 90s. We had U2 occasionally give us a masterpiece, and of course, Metallica's input into the heavy rock genre cannot be understated. Of course, as we moved into the 90s, the introduction of grunge seemed to show us that we still had heights to accomplish in rock and roll. Of course, some of the better bands during this period were Pearl Jam, Smashing Pumpkins, Alice in Chains, and Stone Temple Pilots. With MTV then introducing rock bands Unplugged, a lot of acoustic-based artists. Dave Matthew became popular, matching some of the rock bands that were starting to occur on the scenes, such Jam as rock. Green Day. Of course, here we see bands becoming more popular by the moment, such as the Goo Goo Dolls arriving on the scene. Of course, around this time period, the single artist is back. But this time, instead of getting a so just picking on the Goo Goo Dolls, he's just giving one example there. But to say that rock was moving in a pop direction, absolutely it was. But that's nothing new. 
I mean, that's always happened. So every new rock form gets co-opted. And you can go back to Little Richard, who was being co-opted by Pat Boone. <laughs> you know, go back and look at some of those uh, early 50s, or I'm sorry, mid to late 50s uh, rock and roll records. And the next thing you know, you had teen idols in the early 60s when Elvis went uh, overseas to uh, join the army and you had Fabian and you had all these um, uh, teen idols, Frankie Avalon and I mean, come on, you know, every form of music has been co-opted. So look at, um, now some of it was good. I love new wave music, but new wave, I mean, punk got co-opted within about two years, 18 months to 24 months. People were doing a more uh, poppier version of punk. So yeah, I don't know what he's talking about. I think he's just, uh, again, got a narrow bandwidth. So let's keep going. A Prince or a Michael Jackson, we get Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, and a young chap named Bieber. You know, oh. it... So that's the big glaring mistake he makes here, is he goes right from Pearl Jam and, and uh, Alice in Chains and the Goo Goo Dolls into these guys. Okay, so who likes Justin Bieber? I mean, not me. So, Donny Osmond? The Partridge family? I mean, come on. You know, we, uh, and, and some of it has aged pretty well, the monkeys, right? They're kind of fun to listen to. But we have had this uh, uh, pop element in, in uh, popular music for a long time. For a long time. So to just pick on these guys, so I think when he makes that segue from the grunge bands to these guys, he's glossing over a lot. And he's really not making an apples to oranges comparison here. Because what about, uh, you know, what about, I mean, come on, anybody from Muse to Dream Theater to, and everyone we've been hitting up on this channel. I mean, come on, Radiohead? I mean, these are the cool bands, not these guys. So, yeah, you know, we've always had pop stars. And I always remind people, the number one selling single of the 1970s was You Light Up My Life by Debbie Boone. So, yeah, the guy is, the guy is just making a... Um, a logical fallacy here. He's, he's got these apples he's talking about, then he starts talking about oranges. And it's not clear. So the guy's not crazy. He's, you know, like I say, I watched a little bit of the video. He's got a couple good points here and there, but just, man, just jumping from, uh, from uh, Alice in Chains and Stone Temple Pilots to Britney Spears, you're making a quantum leap there, dude, okay? I don't agree with you. Reminds me of wood working. You've got two guys here. Both of them are gonna make a rocking chair, right? This guy over here makes a rocking chair for grandma. He's got a plan. It's simple. He goes down to the lumber yard. He assembles it together. He does a basic sanding job, puts a little stain on it. Grandma loves it. And when she passes away, it's the first thing thrown out in the garbage. But this guy over here, he goes out into the forest. He chooses the wood he wants. He chops the tree down. He mills it. He lovingly assembles the pieces. He varnishes it. And this time, when grandma passes away, this chair is passed on as an heirloom. What's the difference between these two approaches? This is an assembly approach where this is the approach of a true artisan. Well, you know, to me, good rock music, good pop rock music, and good pop music is just the same. But that gets us right back to the original question, doesn't it? Why Assembly does line. today's music suck? All right, so first of all, let's take a look at how the music was approached say back in the 60s. We can use one or two albums here as an example. We can either use the Beach Boys, Pet Sounds, or the Beatles, 
Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now, the reason I'm bringing up these two albums is because the history of the recording of these albums is quite well known. We know what the artist went through to achieve the sounds on these records. And one of the things that remains so very clear on listening to these albums to this very day is the wonderful audio textures that you hear when you listen to this music. With the Beach Boys, this was almost a one-man job. Of course, he had a massive tank to drive into war. He had the wonderful wrecking crew to record a whole lot of that instrumentation. So thank you so for he acknowledging the, the wrecking crew. Musicians on the planet to record the recording tracks. He was the finest songwriter America had to offer, and the best producer, if you ask me. And of course, if his band, me, thank when you. they would come in to record their vocals, were some of the best singers America had to offer. Meanwhile, shortly after, in Britain, we have George Martin, the world's greatest producer, if you ask me, if teaming ask up me, with a you. united Lennon and McCartney with brand new material, and they're still writing material as they're recording this album. Lennon's imaginative mind demanding new approaches that he couldn't articulate and Paul's artistic approach being more direct and him working more in conjunction with George Martin. Of course, this would continue and be very evident on side two on the Beatles album, Abbey Road. But you know when... So one thing about, uh, he talks about all the lengths that they went to to record that. Well, keep in mind, they didn't have the tools they have today. So yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, you know, I, I've read things about classic rock uh, about how uh, if you listen to Alice Cooper's Schools Out, there's a school bell. Bob Ezrin, the producer, it took him a long time to find just the right school bell. He didn't have a digital library. Yeah, yeah, people worked harder back in the day. But so what? I mean, those are wonderful records. I mean, he's right about that. They're wonderful records. But the other flaw I think he's making here is that the Beach Boys and the Beatles were the wellspring for so much future music. Well, you know, there can only be one Beatles, there can, there can only be one Beach Boys, so that's not really fair. And today in the modern era, we talk a lot about post-rock and post-hardcore and all these different uh, types of uh, music. Um, uh, shoegaze and emo that's more 90s but you know what I'm talking about and then there's uh, I, I read today uh, what was it uh, crescendo core yeah crescendo core to describe bands like Godspeed you Black Emperor so you know we're trying to make a different statement in the modern era we can't just keep writing uh, you know I don't know one for I'm not a musician one one, four, six pop songs or whatever. You know, Yesterday was a great pop song, but it was written yesterday. So we're in the 21st century. Music sounds different to reflect the era that we're in. So, I don't know, I don't think that's fair. Those guys were the inspiration, the wellspring. So let's keep going. When I listen to today's music, I don't hear those textures. I don't hear the air around the instruments anymore. And there's a very good reason for that. First of all, we need to get back to the days of radio. You see, back in no, the day, radio going. made its money, just like television, just like YouTube, as a matter of fact, on commercials. Now we I can imagine before they started getting into compression and all of that, they probably had an engineer who actually cranked a volume knob there at the station when commercials came on. We've all complained how loud commercials are. One of the reasons that commercials are so much louder than say the television program you're accustomed to watching is because of compression. You see in the studio when they master these commercials, they run these commercials through compressors. Now you can bet your bottom dollar they've already, while they recorded this commercial, recorded it at top audio levels, almost to the point of distortion. How could they make this even louder? You compress the signal and then during mastering. 
So he's got one or he's got one bad point, one good point. He was talking about space and music. Yeah, and there's stuff like Florence and the Machine, which is so busy when I listen to it. It isn't Miles Davis or Pink Floyd. But again, you're cherry picking. There's plenty of music with space in it. Uh, you listen to um, uh, somebody, uh, you know, one of the pole runners up was uh, Laura Marling. And uh, I've heard a little bit of her music. There's plenty of space in it. So, yeah, I don't know what he's he's talking about. Uh, and the impact of producers like Brian Eno is still rippling through this century. So I, I don't know what he's talking about. Now, when he talks about compression, this is the first time in the video that he has a valid point. Compression, I've said that... Uh, what I don't like is the mix. So when I do a playlist on Spotify and some of the music is compressed and some of it isn't and the volume levels are so different and I cannot adjust them to make a decent uh, playlist. Um, yeah, com compression bugs me a little bit too. So I mean, yeah, he's, he's got a point there, but that's his first valid point. And that doesn't mean that the new music sucks. Okay, he's just talking about some mastering techniques that are not so savory. So, uh, yeah, it's an unfortunate thing, but it doesn't reflect on the music. So, let's keep going. You crank that up. Now, Sorry. we need to go back to that early 80s period that I've already identified. It was during that time period that a war started. And, you know, just like a lot of police actions, that war never seemed to end. Of course, I'm talking about the loudness wars. You see, it was right around that time period that music was being transferred and sold digitally. It was at this time period that record sales almost disappeared overnight and the CD became our main media for recorded music. Now, once you get a music signal into a computer digitally, there's a whole lot you can do to increase the volume. And with so many classic bands having their older albums being transferred to CD, a war happened. You see, a lot of the newer sounds achieved by newer bands in the 80s were getting a much hotter source. And so a lot of consumers, when they would put on older albums, would notice the volume drop. Put on David Bowie's Let's Dance, wonderful. Put on one of your favorite Moody Blues records and all of a sudden everything sounded much more tame. Now no doubt remastering some of these older recordings had to occur and volume levels okay. did need to be brought up. But really, you. if you think about it, what were these morons thinking? Did they not know that all of us at home had volume knobs? But then things got out of hand. All of a sudden, they were increasing the volume on these re-releases to the point of distortion. Now, distortion by itself is not a bad thing. Rock and roll has used distortion to good effect always. But we're talking about a distortion over the overall sound. And then we started hearing some of the engineers and producers as well as artists in the early 2000s using an almost distortive approach to some of the basic tracks before it ever got on to the final stereo mix. This creates that muddy sound that you could swear. It just must be your imagination when you listen to some of the newer tracks in music today. Another approach is the overuse of bass and drum machines. You know, the use of drum machines have become so prevalent that they've actually learned to build in algorithms for the machines to make an occasional mistake so they don't sound so robotic. So far, as far as I Now, when he was talking about the loudness wars, I will say a lot of things have been corrected in the 21st century. So when I listen to Stephen Wilson's remixes, not everybody's a lover of that, but he's gone back and done a lot of prog bands. And wow, I think, uh, you know, I think it brings out all the best elements, but he keeps uh, the dynamics in check. And he's talked about that in interviews. There's a lot of remastering engineers who are correcting things that were done in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, there were labels like RCA. I have a lot of those early Bowie RCA discs. They're they're pretty valuable now, and they're mastered crappy, you know. And uh, 
Bowie's catalog sounds so much better now. Uh, Visconti's been remastering everything. So we're making corrections. Now this thing here about drum machines and robotics, well, you know, if you're doing techno music or you're Daft Punk or somebody like that, you use it to great effect. Um, yeah, look, I mean, drum machines, uh, okay, here's a really good example, okay? This is right off the top of my head. But the song that blew up this year and went number one after 37 years was Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill. Marvelous song. It has a drum machine in it. And people love that song. So does it, so what does it do to that song? It actually makes it better. I mean, it's special because it has that synth line and that beat and it gives it the character. So a drum machine or any kind of electronics is not good or bad in and of itself. Yeah, all right. So there's so much, oh, I gotta tell you, late 90s techno music, I love that stuff, love that stuff. All right, let's keep going. I'm concerned the algorithms are not working. And then there's the overuse of bass. You know, a lot of times the bass that you're hearing on a lot of the newer music is not even from bass guitar. Yeah. A lot of it Mug is just bass? played on keyboards with a pre-patched bass sound so? to sound like a stringed bass. Again, so? bass is a very important aspect. You know, the Beatles were very frustrated. Some of their earlier albums, they weren't getting the bass response that some of the artists in America were getting. Paul especially would work with the engineers, George Martin, and even switching his famous violin bass to his Rickenbacker, all to get a much better, deeper bass sound. But what do we have in today's music? You're on the we dance have floor. This driving, you want that bass to hit. Overwhelming bass that drowns out all of the other instrumentation. You wonder why they even bothered to put keyboards in the background. You can't hear it. And then, of course, you've got the great demon of music, auto tune. Now, Auto-Tune first came to the public awareness with Cher Song Believe. And of course, she used Auto-Tune in that song, whether you like it or not, as a creative device. But don't worry, soon every monkey in the zoo was doing exactly what she did. But then it settled down and they started using Auto-Tune for a very specific reason. Now they could have artists who couldn't quite sing as well as artists in the past, and correct their vocals while still in the studio. You can even use auto-tune live. I swear, all of the footage I saw with Paul McCartney in his tour here this summer, I heard auto-tune. You musicians out there, give it a listen, you can hear it. Now, I know, everybody will say, why do you hate auto-tune? After all, all it does is correct mistakes. Don't you want the very best product? Well, yes, I do. Here's the problem with auto-tune. It takes away vocal approach. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. You have the example of Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. How he dived down on those notes. That's his vocal delivery. That's his vocal approach. How about those screams and screeches and squelches that you hear on Hey Jude by Paul McCartney? So he's talking about a narrow amount of music. And they go screeching out. Now, both of these singers are two of the greatest singers in the 20th century. Most music doesn't use auto-tune. And auto -tune. it was their approach, their delivery, how they attacked a note that became artistic. Now you've got clowns singing into a microphone, and all I can say is, if they can't carry a tune, how would they even begin to know anything about approaching a vocal line and how to deliver it? We're missing out on something here, people. Now, auto-tune, the use of keyboard bass playing and electronic drums along with compression, 
All of these things that I've discussed mm. can be very useful tools in the recording session, but people have gotten lazy. These days, they follow the simple format, big, thick bass lines to jar Not your lazy. car. Have you ever noticed how some people have the greatest speakers in their car, but they have an inexpensive car, and it's the car that rattles. They don't hear it inside. It's the rest of us in the neighborhood who hears the rattling of the entire car around Get the street. Get off my lawn. And then there's this proclivity of the general audience these days willing to let shows like America's Got a Toilet inform them on what is good music. We Okay, just crashed, but I think we've got enough of an a idea A lot here. of same old, same old effects and people. So I've had some problems with the VLC player, but I, I think we've seen enough of this guy. So, you know, auto-tune, is it overused? Well, there's a lot of music today. There's more product than there ever was before. So if you want to hear the overuse of auto-tune, there's lots of examples. I mean, I get bugged by it. Uh, his point about Cher using it to effect uh, that's spot on and then a lot of people today are using it to compensate for lack of talent but it's a narrow bandwidth you know there's plenty of great music and people who can perform live so yeah I don't know yeah I was shocked one of my favorite uh, bands one of my favorite albums that I really like is real estate and I was watching a live performance of them and I was shocked at how bad the singer was I was like really because his vocals on the album are so beautiful. And uh, I don't think that's a case of auto-tune. But yeah, you know, once in a while you see something where you go, oh my God, you know, can that person really sing? Um, yeah, but that's always been the case. So there's been lots of people who performed poorly live way back in the day. So I don't know. I'm not sure what he's talking about here. Uh, He's making a lot of broad assumptions, sweeping statements, and trying to smear that over everybody's music. And you know what? My, my generation, the older generation, didn't like our music. But we knew better. So, you know, if they said turn that shit down, my parents never said shit, but they did say turn it down. And uh, I knew it was good stuff, so. You know, when I was uh, in early high school, uh, I remember writing a review for the newspaper, reviewing um, Queen's Sheer Heart Attack. Well, they hadn't even recorded Bohemian Rhapsody yet. And uh, some kids gave me shit, like, hey, write about somebody we know, you know. I did a review of Born to Run, and uh, the sports editor said, uh, he says, no one's ever heard of Bruce Springsteen. and uh, he gave me a bunch of crap, and I said, yeah, but you're going to hear about him. And I was cocky, but, you know, I was right. I mean, I'm not bragging. Uh, I had a mentor that really helped me, so he was uh, pretty sharp. And, you know, it's, um, it's just one of those things where that music, I mean, I remember bringing, I remember the, the day that Night at the Opera came out. I, I bought it, and I talked the teacher into getting a record player from the library and we put it on and in the middle of um, the prophet song she said oh turn that off it's giving me a headache so you know I grew up with that kind of thing and I am not going to be one of those people I am not going to knock the newer generation no way the music's great you can see how much I enjoy it on this channel so yeah, I think the guy's out to lunch. He probably his best comment he made was on compression. You know, he's got some valid points there, but man, some really sweeping statements. So that's it. I just wanted to blow some holes in this uh, guy's smoke screen, and uh, so that's it. So if you liked this video, let me know. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit different content, and as we say here in Mexico. Uh, Buen dia. Hit that like or subscribe button. Thank you.